Good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, do open your Bibles, as Dan said. Um, we're reading from Mark chapter 14, um, and we're starting at verse 12, going through to verse 31. Mark 14, starting at verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and pre make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and the man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you to a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, the one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, the one who dips the bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given it, given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I will drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows thrice, you yourself will discern me three times. But Peter insisted empathetically, even if I die with you, I will never disown you. And the others said the same. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Um, I apologize if my shorts offend you, but in here this morning, it was so hot. It was getting to unbearably hot. I thought you'd rather me preaching shorts than pass out. It's actually a bit cooler uh, this evening than it was um, this morning. Um, do keep... Um, Mark 14 open in front of you as we look at that together and let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this glorious gospel, for the truth that you've been teaching us through it, for the change that you've, been, uh, you've brought about in our hearts, the renewing of our minds that has taken place for how you've humbled us before you, how you've exalted Christ in our hearts and minds. And we pray this evening that we'll come before you in humility and that you'll flood our lives with your grace, that you'll speak to us and we'll hear your voice through the scriptures and that we'll respond as your children should in humble, delightful obedience. Amen. 
when I was studying in London, um, the college that I was at, every semester it used to have a, a group of about 20 um, American exchange students. Uh, we were in the big um, house and we'd have them round for food and drink because they tended to be 18 and 19 year olds, so we liked to look after them. Uh, and one uh, particular week, I found out that there was a group of them who had a, uh, well, they said an interest, uh, a liking of single malt uh, whiskey. And I had a collection of single malt uh, whiskey, so I invited them round um, to sample it. Uh, feeling that I ought to be generous, because Americans always um, seek to be um, generous, either ger generous or showing off with what they've got, but they want to be generous. So I thought, okay, I'll open my 50 pound bottle. Uh, of 18-year-old, this is like 20 years ago, so maybe it's about 80, 90 pounds now. I thought, I'll open this and I'll share it with them. So I poured some glasses for them. Uh, and then as I went to the cupboard to get myself a glass, I heard what I can only describe as a nightmarish noise. And it went like this. <coughs> glug, 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 glug. I turned around to see my uncouth American friends pouring Pepsi. <laughs> Uh, into uh, my single malt uh, whiskey. Um, I exclaimed to them, I said, what are you doing? I might as well have just poured it down the drain. That's how I felt uh, about what um, they'd done. What an absolute waste. And I realized that day that one should never share fine whiskey with bourbon drinking Americans. <laughs> now, of course, it is a shame um, to weigh such an expensive um, bottle um, of whiskey. But what a shame of kind of untold proportions to waste your life, to pour out your life and expend your life on the wrong endeavor, to the wrong end and on the wrong goals. Can you imagine that uh, your life being that bottle of whiskey and all the years of your life just poured out and wasted for no good purpose. If you think about it, isn't that what people were saying of Jesus and what many people say of him? What a great guy, what a great teacher, such a promising young um, teacher uh, in his early 30s. Look at the crowds that he's drawing. And then it also tragically ended with his death. What a waste of a life. Could he only have accomplished so much more if it had just played his cards differently so he didn't end up getting crucified by the Romans? What a wasted life. But of course, last week we heard the disciples saying of a woman that she wasted that expensive jar of perfume as she broke it and poured it on Jesus to anoint him. And they were saying, what a waste. What a waste of your resources. What a waste of your life savings. And maybe that's what people say to you. Maybe that's what people say to you as a Christian. I wonder if you've had that um, sort of charge. of saying, look, you're wasting your life. Following this Jesus, walking in his ways, making sacrifices for him. What a waste of a life. Pour down the drain. You could be doing so much and more. But the truth is, my friends, that those who make those accusations, in fact, each one of us in this room, and every single person outside of this room, is pouring out their life. Everybody is expending their life in the pursuit of something to, the, to some goal or some end. The days of life are slipping by, being poured out, that's inevitable. The only real question is, what are you pouring your life out for? What are you expending your energy on? What are you dedicating yourself to? What are you making your sacrifices for? For what purpose and end do you expend yourself? And if you think about it, last week the disciples said to that lady, look, what you've done is a wasteful thing. To dedicate your life and your life saving to Jesus was a wasteful thing. And Jesus said in contrast to that, she did a beautiful thing. She 
She poured herself out, this woman, in extravagant, extravagant, emptying, embarrassing worship. And Jesus said she did it foreshadowing his pouring out of himself. She did this in preparation for my burial. And so we now come to the, the point, a meal, where this meal prefigures Jesus as pouring out of himself. Verses 12 to 26, Jesus poured himself out. Now what do we learn about Jesus pouring out of himself from these verses? Well, the first thing we learn is that Jesus as pouring out of himself was controlled. It was controlled. Jesus' life wasn't taken from him. He didn't waste his life. It wasn't this tragic end because of unforeseen circumstances. If that's the case, if Jesus didn't see it coming, how on earth did he plan every detail? When you read this, and Jesus has poured himself out, what strikes you from these verses? Jesus says, go here, you'll meet this man. He will say this to you, you say that to him, and then he'll tell you, you can do this. Do you think that's somebody who's getting caught by surprise? Do you think that's somebody who's pouring himself out and uh, his life was ripped from him, tragically? No, every detail, everything that's happening is according to his sovereign plan. All the religious leaders may be scheming, Herodians may be plotting, but Jesus says, each step is going just as I have ordered it. I will pour myself out. My life will not be taken from me. He was orchestrating events, not events overtaking him. When Jesus says he must go as it is written, he's speaking of a divine plan. And that's the second um, thing about Jesus is pouring himself out. It was a prophesied pouring out. It was a controlled pouring out. It was a prophesied pouring out, verses 21 and 24. Um, the words, um, the phrases, the imagery surrounding this uh, meal is all um, found in the Old Testament, the Passover meal um, in Exodus um, 24. The blood of the covenant is to point us back um, to the Exodus the fellowship sacrifice, the language is pouring um, out, comes from that Passover meal. And then even when Jesus says, and he talks about his life being given for many, he's getting them to think about the prophecies of Isaiah, about what he will do as a sacrificial lamb, as he pours out his life um, for many. Jesus is taking the Passover meal, he's giving it a new significance as it becomes the Lord's Supper. But in doing so, he's saying, look, my pouring out is not something that's just being cooked up now. And no plan B. No, this was prophesied and planned from the beginning. And it's throughout the scriptures bringing to this point, well, I will pour myself out just as it has been said and written. But Jesus' pouring out is also a, a solitary um, pouring out. Um, out, a solitary um, pouring out, verses 20 and 27. Now, you remember last week, that, woman, that woman's beautiful act um, of devotion was sandwiched between um, scheming and um, betrayal, and now this meal that signifies Jesus' beautiful act of devotion as he will pour himself out is sandwiched between treachery and betrayal from his, most, um, innocent, uh, from his most inner circle of friends and followers. Here he is, this woman, on either side of her thing, the people are plotting and scheming, a sandwich in the middle, a beautiful act. Here is Jesus now, and either side he's got this betrayal, uh, he's got this um, treachery from Judas, and in the middle, a beautiful act of devotion, prefigured and symbolized um, in the meal. This meal that is about God renewing his covenant, his fellowship with his people, drawing um, near. You see, the account of the Last Supper begins 
with the Lord, declaring that one of the 12 um, will betray him. And it ends with saying, and then the rest of you will scatter. The remaining 11 will desert him. One will betray, the rest will desert. When Jesus pours himself out, he's not going to be surrounded by his followers. He will do it alone, without support, without help, without any assistance or any encouragement from any of those who've been close with him and followed him wherever he went. And here there's a, a clue to uh, discipleship, uh, what it will look like for us who are, <clears throat> as we will see, are called to pour ourselves out. My dear friends, if you're going to pour yourselves out for Jesus Christ, don't expect to have a crowd of people around you applauding you and assisting you and encouraging you in that. Just one more thing about Jesus pouring out. It was a terrible um, pouring out. I'm not going to say too much on this, <clears throat> partly because I'm stealing from next week, uh, verses 32 to 42. But let just to say this. Before the cross um, came in Gethsemane, as the agony of his death drew very near, um, our Lord uh, passed through a, a very dark um, night um, of the soul. Would he continue on the course um, that, he'd been, that he'd been set for him? Would he obediently continue as he had for those three years of ministry? You see, as it turns out, uh, we sing a lot about the cross, and obviously rightly so, because the Bible uh, is full uh, of speak about Jesus' sacrifice. But in some respects, our salvation wasn't just won on the Mount of Crucifixion, but on the Mount of Olives. When Jesus, with everything that was before him, the agony of what awaited him, as the wrath of God would fall upon him for the sins of his people, finally and conclusively submitted his will to that of the Father in heaven, so that he would triumph at the cross but that was an amazing submission of self-denial, self-surrender. Why is that important to us? Because my friends, as we're called to pour ourselves out uh, for Jesus, we're not going to do so with a crowd of people around us saying, yeah, let's all do it. But also to pour yourself out, that fight that battle begins in the will. It begins in the will, in the mind. You have to decide and determine. We met someone this week from Rwanda. Um, he had an African name, um, but he then told us his name, which is basically Determine. Uh, and he said <coughs> that the reason he took that name is because when he became a Christian, he was determined to make a difference for Jesus. He was determined um, to live for Christ. He was determined to give his whole life over um, to the cause of Christ. It's a decision that begins in the will to pour uh, oneself um, out. But Jesus' life was not the only one that is poured out in this narrative. At verses 18 to 21, Judas poured himself out. Judas poured himself out. Now, what a, what a sad picture um, of a life um, wasted. Judas. <laughs> Judas has spent three years with Jesus, seeing all the miracles, hearing all the teaching. He had the same privilege as the other 11 disciples. He had the same privileges as you and I. He had every opportunity, Judas, every opportunity to pour out his life and the most worthiest of causes. But he determined to pour out his life in a worthless cause. To expend himself 
on that which is worthless as he betrayed Christ. So let's examine Judas. What do you know about, notice about Judas? Well, the first thing is verse 18. He looks the part. Do you not think it's interesting that when Jesus says, one of you will betray me, and I think we all secretly think, oh yeah, the 11 were sitting there saying, well, we know that's going to be Judas. There was no gut reaction from the other 11 that it was Judas, was it? Not one of the gospel writers highlights the uh, fact of saying, oh yeah, we, we immediately knew that he was talking about Judas. No, no one said, oh yeah, I'd always had my doubts about him. No, Judas happily stood amongst the 12, happily sat under Jesus' teaching, happily poured himself out with the other 11 in ministry until the crunch time came. So there he was, he ate the last supper, sung the hymns, and then when the time came, after looking the part, looking like he was one who poured himself out, he betrayed Jesus. Jesus shows us and opens up for us, gives us a window into the dangers of that deep hypocrisy where you can sit there and look the part you're involved in ministry, you're serving in various ways, you're listening to the teaching of Jesus, and then crunch comes, your heart is revealed, and it's all been about self-interest and my own agenda. But Judas also, he sounds the part. It's not that he thought, well, maybe if Judas would have opened his mouth, he would have said something that made us all thought, oh yeah, I knew he was dodgy. No, he silenced the part, doesn't he? Look at verse 19. It says, they were saddened, and one by one they said to him, surely you don't mean me. One by one. That is, Judas said, surely you don't mean me, Jesus. <laughs> I'm here, talking about the things you said, pouring over the Old Testament scriptures singing the songs with you, going out two by two with the others, proclaiming um, you to the other people. Surely you don't mean me. And he said this, he protested his innocence, even though he knew exactly what he was about to do. He made the right noises, even though he knew what was in his heart. He knew that he was going to pour out his life in the service of the religious leaders so that they could arrest and kill Christ, but he still said, I'm with you, Jesus. I wonder whether you've pondered why Jesus went about it this way. Why doesn't Jesus, why does Jesus have all the disciples thinking, well, is it me? Does he mean me? Why didn't he just pull Judas to one side and say, it's you, um, Judas. Here's Judas, the betrayer. The rest of the disciples, look, you can settle down. It's not going to be you who betrays me. I think it's because of this. What Mark is doing and what he often does in his gospel is, is trying to get us to say, oh, it could, it could be me. He says, look, Judas not only looks the part and sounds the part, I want you to see and entertain the fact that you could play the part. Peter and John and the others all have to entertain the possibility that it could have been them. They could have poured themselves out in this unworthiest of pursuits. You see, it may not have been John or Peter who betrayed Jesus, but John and Peter were both capable of it. And he's causing these disciples to search their own hearts, to think the unthinkable, and to think that it could have possibly been them. You see, there's a warning here for us, isn't there? A real warning that we need um, to hear. And it says, look, you can look the part, you can share in the ministry of Jesus, you can speak the part publicly, declaring your loyalty to Jesus. 
when all the time you're pouring yourself out for your own purpose to your own end that has nothing to do with Jesus. Just like Judas did. But there's one final person I want us to look at. And that's Peter. Peter pours himself out, verses 27 to 31. Of course, we, we know, we're familiar with Peter, that Peter is the one who displays discipleships, warts and all. Um, you get to see what discipleship really looks like. As he pours himself out as a disciple, we see the realities of discipleships, the ups and downs. He's a disciple who fails, he falls, he fumbles more than once. And most of us, I guess, as we think about it, as we reflect on our own discipleship, on our own following of Jesus, we can identify with Peter and think, yeah. You see, Peter has the heart and mind of a disciple, verse 29 and 31. He'd found in Jesus of Nazareth everything the answer to the problem of sin and, and guilt. Jesus had flooded his life with, with hope, with meaning, with purpose and direction. He committed his life to Christ. He'd left everything to follow him. He'd left his family, fishing and business in Galilee to follow Jesus wherever he went. Is that not pouring yourself out? He was ready to pour himself out for Jesus. He would declare it boldly in verse 29 when he says, even if all fall away, I will not and Peter meant it. He meant every word of it. And he was full of confidence about living for Jesus, full of confidence for even about dying for Jesus, if that what was necessary. And I would propose to you, if you have the Holy Spirit and you're born of God, that, that is you. And sometimes you're just thinking, I just want to give all for you, Jesus. I just want to pour myself out. All others might fall away, but I will not. I'll stick with you. I will keep going. I'll give um, everything. And your heart is there. You're fired up for Jesus. You want to make a difference for the Lord in your life. You want to change your name to determine, because you're gonna, I'm just going to be determined to live for you. And we say, look at Peter, Peter, Look at that declaration, he's right behind you, Lord, and I'm right behind Peter, and I'm right up there with him. But I don't think we have any reason to doubt for one minute the desire in Peter's heart that he truly wanted to pour himself out for Jesus. But Peter, not only has the heart and mind of a disciple, but he has the heart and mind of a weak sinner too, doesn't he? And when temptation comes, our sinful nature grabs hold of it, runs headlong into it. We earnestly want to pour ourselves out for Jesus and for his kingdom, but doubts and self-preservation and self-interest so easily pour into our minds and into our hearts and drive that out of us. Again, next, next week, just think about it. The, the disciples, they're there and they want to be with Jesus and they flag in the garden. <laughs> they can't even stay awake. Peter, he just made this bold declaration. Then we find him quaking in the courtyard when he denied Christ three times. Peter and the disciples, they want to pour themselves out for Jesus. I guess you and I want to pour ourselves out and for Jesus, and what do we know? The spirit is so willing, and the flesh is so weak. But praise God, we have a Savior whose spirit was not only willing, but the flesh was also strong. He overcame in the garden, at the cross, no self interest. No doubt creeping in. Submitting to the will of the Father, pouring himself out as a ransom for many, just as was prophesied, just as was planned, completely under his 
control. But even the wrestle with Peter, later when Peter denies Jesus, there's a huge battle taking place. Just think about it. Think about Peter. Hopefully he's a picture of you. A loyalty and love for Jesus kept Peter in the courtyard, didn't it? He was in the courtyard. But that fear and that self-preservation kept him lying in the courtyard. Isn't that interesting? He's in the courtyard. Oh, yeah, Peter, you're there. You want to pour yourself out. And then, oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't know him. He denies himself to stay by his Lord, but then he denies his Lord to save himself. But Peter knows and will come to understand that he, the one who couldn't pour himself out in that moment as he would have desired and wanted, can always look to the one who poured himself out so that there can be forgiveness. We pour ourselves out because we actually live, we bask, we bathe. We've been doing that today in the sun. And we're walking out and just basking in the sun, bathing in the warmth and its light. It's beautiful. And we can pour ourselves out because we bathe and bask in the knowledge and the power of our Lord who poured himself out, who gave his blood as a ransom for many. Before he um, died, the missionary um, C.T. Studd wrote this poem demonstrating that he understood this way of life, this pouring of oneself out um, for Christ. And I'll finish with this. Here's what he wrote. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one, soon its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding my selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life, it will soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, Yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say, "Twas worth it all. Only one life. Twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen.